Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Jennifer Gross. I'm a senior healthcare specialist at Point Right. And um, before we uh, begin with the presentation, I just have a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, all the audio lines are muted on your end. So if you have any questions for me, please feel free to ask. Uh, there's a chat function that's built into the GoToWebinar toolbar. So just click on the chat and type in a message to me and time permitting, I'll uh, do my best to answer them. And uh, also there is a handout for this presentation, which we will be emailing out afterwards to all the attendees. But if you would like to get a jump on that and download it, it's been attached to the GoToWebinar toolbar as well. So you should see a link to uh, click on to download the handout. So um, again, thank you for joining me today. My name is Jennifer Gross at Point Right. And uh, Point Right um, works directly both with skilled nursing facilities and their hospital uh, referring partners to help ensure uh, quality care and uh, how and help the facilities and their hospitals use their data to work collaboratively together to provide the best care to their patients and their uh, skilled nursing facility residents. Uh, so for the, the purpose of this uh, session is to go over um, a little thing called the patient-driven payment model. You may have noticed that um, for you folks at the hospitals that your skilled nursing facility partners have been a little distracted lately. Um, we are in the thick of the transition effective October 1st to the new patient-driven payment model, which is the um, basically the structure of how Medicare skilled nursing facility reimbursement is, is framed going forward. So uh, there's been a transition period, uh, as I said, starting October 1st, that is uh, is starting to get towards the end of that transition period, but there's still going to be a lot of work for facilities to do to get their, uh, their resident slash patient population transitioned over completely to the new payment structure. So uh, first of all, let me see if I can move my slides here. First of all, um, so why should hospitals care, basically? <laughs> why should you pay attention to PDPM, to the patient-driven payment model? And uh, really, it's, it's very, very difficult to change one aspect of reimbursement policy, and I'm talking about federal reimbursement policy, of course, because this is related to Medicare. It's very difficult to change one piece of that policy and not have an effect on other segments of the, um, of the healthcare industry not just the uh, the segment that is directly impacted. If you push down on one area, something is going to pop up elsewhere. So for example, um, back in 1997, uh, for those of you who have been in the industry that long, I've not quite that long for me, but uh, there, there was, of course, the shift um, in, in payment back in 97 for Medicare that, uh, as one example of unintended consequences, um, under skilled nursing facility consolidated billing, uh, made it very difficult for a while for hospitals to refer patients who need dialysis to the skilled nursing facility because the SNF ended up holding the bag for the costs of the transaction transportation to and from the dialysis clinic, as well as the, de, uh, the cost of epoid and alpha, which was quite expensive. Uh, so there, this had to get hammered out in legislation further down the line, but it was just something that ha occurred that made it then difficult further upstream for hospitals to, uh, to refer these complicated patients to skilled nursing facilities because um, SNF's margins, as you are probably aware, are pretty small and uh, being able to shoulder the cost of dialysis was very challenging. Again, it, it eventually got worked out, but not without a lot of uh, pain. So um, I'm, I'm framing this not as a worst case scenario, but, uh, but to uh, just help you to uh, wrap your um, framework around why hospitals should at least have some awareness or understanding of what PDPM is and what is going to be changing at the skilled nursing facility end to help you plan how you are interacting and, and structuring your referrals to your SNF partners. And I'm sure um, a lot of your, uh, a lot of your partners particularly if you're part of a, uh, a, a preferred provider network or an ACO, have already been uh, working on this process. So 
PDPM um, is a um, really a change in focus in how um, Medicare skilled nursing facility reimbursement is structured because up through September 30th of this year, reimbursement under Medicare Part A was heavily, heavily weighted towards the volume of services provided to those skilled nursing facility residents um, during their skilled Part A stay. And volume really equals therapy in this framework. Um, the, the data shifted very obviously to um, the volume of therapy delivery driving the uh, per diem rates that the skilled nursing facilities were billing Medicare. And it, and it got to be a pretty high rate. And the, the, um, the, the real obvious part was that the amount of therapy provided for residents didn't appear to vary very much based on the individual patient characteristics. Um, basically, if you meet a certain, if you met a certain threshold of therapy delivery, you would end up in a resource utilization group or a rug category, regardless of um, whether or not that patient had any comorbidities such as COPD or wound care or diabetes. Um, it was all about the therapy. So of course, uh, that, that doesn't seem to be very conducive to providing uh, resident-centric, patient-centric quality care. So the patient-driven payment model is CMS's step in that direction. The way the payment framework for PDPM is structured is based on verifiable clinical patient characteristics and specific care needs, what their um, diagnoses are, what their comorbid conditions are besides the primary skilled nursing facility diagnosis, other issues such as cognitive status, any other special treatments or procedures such as IV therapy um, or, um, or dialysis uh, or tube feeding are, all play into components of the PDPM reimbursement. Now these are patient characteristics and these are care needs and they are, these are services that have been provided by the SNF all along, but all of this very um, important clinical information didn't end its up in um, showing up through the reimbursement because it was all obscured by the amount of therapy, skilled therapy that was being provided, whether it was physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech language, language pathology, often a combination of the three. Now, another big change in PDPM for the, from the skilled nursing facility perspective is that the reimbursement for this SNF stay is being based on one assessment, and I'll talk about that assessment in just a few minutes. Um, previously, what would happen for uh, SNFs who are being reimbursed under the old RUG4 system through September 30th of this year was that there would be an, an assessment completed within the first week of a stay, and then there would have to be a recheck uh, um, every seven days to see if the level of therapy being provided was still at the same level, and there were periodic scheduled assessments that were mandated. So it was a lot of work, a lot of legwork that needed to be done on the SNF end to make sure that the the, um, that the per diem rates were appropriately calibrated to what was going on with that patient at that particular point in time. Um, CMS has said, okay, we're going to stop that, stop all that assessment burden. Um, however, the reimbursement being pinned on the one assessment that's done within the first week of the resident's or patient's stay in the SNF really needs to be done accurately because it's going to set the payment rate from the get-go and then there will be per diem adjustments as time moves on based on CMS's um, uh, initial research. Uh, they structured the payment model to automatically taper over time and I'll also be talking about that in just a little bit. So since that one assessment is really driving the bus in, that, in uh, the PDPM world as far as getting the correct payment per diem rate for the facility for caring for that patient, it's really extremely important for the skilled nursing facility to have the information that they need on admission or shortly thereafter to support um, getting the right payment under PDPM. 
So what is this assessment that I'm talking about here? The minimum data set or MDS, SNFs have been living and breathing the MDS uh, for decades now. Uh, it is a federal, federally mandated assessment that is a standardized data set that all skilled nursing facilities that participate in Medicare and or Medicaid have to produce on a regular basis for all residents who are residing in a Medicare or Medicaid certified bed in a skilled nursing facility. Now this is, it, it's called the minimum data set. It's actually really big. Um, I'm just looking at a printout of a comprehensive assessment and it's got 51 pages on it, <laughs> um, counting the signature page. So there's a lot of information. It, it's not a complete head to toe assessment, but it includes information such as functional status, cognitive assessment, any issues with behavioral problems or mood problems, um, any wounds or treatments to the skin, nutritional status, if the resident has any pain or health problems such as uh, um, vomiting or shortness of breath. Um, of course, active diagnoses, what treatments and what medications are being provided, the amount of therapy being provided, and uh, what the goals are for discharge. Um, so a lot of info in this skilled nursing facility minimum data set. Now, the CMS has mandated this MDS assessment and it's required to be done on admission within the, with, by day 14 at the very latest and then on a quarterly and an annual basis for long-term residents in the skilled nursing facility. And there are also requirements for if the resident's status has changed enough that would imply that the uh, overall plan of care needs to be changed. There's another assessment that's required for that. And if that resident is discharged from the skilled nursing facility, um, either to the hospital return anticipated or to the community or another facility with return not anticipated. So there's lots of work that needs to be done to keep this MDS ball rolling. And the data in the minimum data set feeds into reimbursement um, as well as quality reporting. If you're familiar with Nursing Home Compare, you'll see, and Five Star, you'll, you know there's a component that has to do with quality measures. Most of the quality measures, not all of them, but most of the quality measures are driven by what was coded on that minimum data set. So the facilities cannot basically, they live and die by the MDS. Now, as far as reimbursement is concerned, the MDS assessment is also used to set reimbursement for Medicare Part A skilled coverage. Um, and this is a parallel track with all these federally mandated assessments that I talked about on the previous slide, admission quarterly, annually. That's one requirement. The Medicare um, Part A requirement is a separate requirement. <laughs> so um, there, there's a very, very special professional in a, in, a, in a SNF called an MDS coordinator or a resident assessment coordinator. I used to be one of them. I call myself a recovering MDS coordinator. These are extremely important people in the SNF. They, they are uh, usually um, almost always a nurse, usually a, an RN, and they are very, very skilled at managing this process. So um, the MDS is used, as we're going to talk about, to set the reimbursement rate through now through PDPM. And it's also used for other payers. Now, depending on the actual payer, uh, Medicare Advantage plans historically have used the same payment structure the per diem, to set the per diem rates that Medicare uses. But with PDPM coming it's all up for grabs now and facilities have been renegotiated with their Medicare Advantage payers and SNFs often deal with multiple payers all at once for their for their Medicare Advantage or, or Medicare replacement plans. So managed care plans do have the option to use PDPM to set their rates or use another rate setting me method and, and SNFs really have to keep track of who, who's paying the bill to make sure that they're meeting their requirements. And the MDS is also used to set reimbursement for Medicaid long-term care custodial care in more than 30 states nationwide. So again, slightly important. <laughs> Now, part of the transition to PDPM, I mentioned all of those assessment checkpoints that were required under the previous Medicare fee-for-service system. Um, PDPM streamlines that MDS schedule. 
Uh, this table basically tells you everything you need to know. There is an initial Medicare assessment, which is required to be completed um, within the first week of this day, or, or the assessment reference date is the, the anchor date of that MDS. And that assessment reference date can be set any day from day one through day eight of the skilled nursing facility stay. And this is absolutely required. If you don't have an initial Medicare assessment, you don't get paid under PDPM. And once you complete that MDS and you bill, the payment days will carry from the first day of the SNF stay through the end of the Medicare stay, unless on the second line, an interim payment assessment is completed. So CMS did recognize that sometimes things change in the resident's clinical condition or in their functional status, maybe they came in completely non-weight bearing um, and um, their, the, um, the therapy care team was waiting for them to be able to get up and about. Well, that change in functional status could very well be enough to pay, uh, to change the payment level in one or more of the PDPM components. If that is the case, the facility has the option to complete what, what we're calling an IPA, an interim payment assessment, at any time after that initial Medicare assessment is done. Now, this is not a mandated required assessment. It is totally optional. So the expectation is that if a SNF is only going to want to complete an IPA if it's going to increase their reimbursement. Um, but from that point, the payment will change, the per diem rate will change from the date of that assessment through the end of the Medicare stay unless another IPA has to be completed for some reason. Usually the, I, we, we kind of doubt that ha will happen a lot, um, but it's very early. So we certainly don't have the data to, um, to back up that um, assumption. And then last but not least is the SNF Part A PPS discharge assessment. Remember I mentioned that an MDS is required when a resident is discharged from the facility. Um, Medicare also requires an assessment be completed when the resident discharges from Medicare Part A skilled coverage, whether or not they go home or to the, to the community. Now the date of that assessment is the end of the Medicare stay, whether they're leaving or whether it's the last Medicare covered day if they stay on in the SNF. Now this is required, but it, it's not used for payment. All it does is put the stop, puts the, puts the end date on the Medicare coverage. All right. So it's complicated, but it used to be even more complicated. <laughs> So what contributes to PDPM? So this is the type of information that your skilled nursing facility partners are going to be asking you for. Um, these four lanes, swim lanes on my screen here, are the main comp case mix components of PDPM. There is a fifth component, which is a non-case mix component, which is basically a base rate that is based on the facility's location and their local wage index. But we won't go into that because it doesn't uh, it isn't driven by the assessment so for PD, pdpm there are components for physical and occupational therapy they're combined together in one component speech language pathology non-therapy ancillary services and nursing services now um, these uh, each of these components has its own chunk of the overall per diem rate and what case mix group will be assigned to each component will depend on what's coded on that MDS assessment. And you may notice that there are some similarities between these components. So for example, the pr principal skilled nursing facility diagnosis um, is the real driver for PTOT and SLP co um, categories that sets the clinical, um, clinical category for those two components, but it's just one diagnosis that is captured. Um, anything such as prior surgeries, functional status for activities of daily living, comorbid conditions, um, cognitive assessment, um, any other spe special treatments or procedures, you'll see that there's overlap between these categories that, um, that mean that if you're able to capture not just the principal diagnosis, but also any comorbid conditions and other diagnoses that are being addressed in the skilled nursing facility, 
that has the impact of in, uh, of increasing the case mix group for each of the uh, each of the categories. So just a little bit of documentation will go a long way in PDPM. Now remember, all of this is being funneled into that initial Medicare assessment, which we, needs to be completed within the first week of the resident stay. Anywhere from day one through day eight um, is the assessment reference date for this MDS. So what that means is that SNFs are going to need information from the hospitals that are referring these uh, these patients to their skilled nursing facility after a Medicare qualifying hospital stay. So I mentioned the initial Medicare assessment. So that means all this information will be needed on the front end of the stay. Um, and if, if this information is not provided either during a pre-admission screening or um, sent along with the patient when they're on their way to the skilled nursing facility, chances are you're going to be hearing from your SNF partners if they don't already have um, some kind of remote um, integration from their um, uh, EMR system and your EMR system where they can just look stuff up, expect to receive a lot of phone calls <laughs> from the skilled nursing facilities. So what are we what are what are SNFs going to need from the hospitals? Well, of course, ICD-10 codes. Um, not just the primary diagnosis for the hospital stay, although that's very important to um, help the uh, um, attending physician in the skilled nursing facility assign the correct diagnosis for the SNF stay, um, but also any comorbid diagnoses. Uh, for example, you may very well be treating, uh, you will very likely actually be treating a patient in the hospital for a, uh, a fractured hip um, and a surgical repair, but that same individual um, also could very likely have multiple comorbidities such as COPD with shortness of breath, um, diabetes with retinopathy, or um, perhaps a skin ulcer. Um, all those information, all, all those uh, comorbid conditions, you're addressing them in the hospital, um, but they're not the primary reason for the hospital stay. But the SNF needs to know this just as much because they are going to be continuing to treat those comorbidities in the skilled nursing facility and they uh, need to be able to provide the correct diagnoses, not just the diabetes, but also the retinopathy, for example. Now, surgical procedures um, also play a large role in the skill in the um, uh, PDPM case mix components. So, having the information about that surgery um, uh, is also really key front end. <clears throat> now, the reason for the SNF admission, um, and, and CMS has described it pretty succinctly um, in all of their PDPM training. It's basically why is this patient going to a SNF? and not going home or to the community? Uh, how come they have to have uh, a skilled nursing 24-7 uh, for a certain period of time after the hospital stay? Now this diagnosis is almost always going to be related to the reason for the, the primary hospital diagnosis, but it is um, often not going to be a, the exact same diagnosis. Of course, with ICD-10, a, a SNF may uh, very well be taking that, that same diagnosis and coding it as a subsequent encounter rather than the initial encounter that you're treating in the hospital. So, um, but the important point is give the SNFs those diagnoses and let them work out which ones uh, need are going to continue to be addressed in the facility going forward. So what could you potentially be seeing from your SNF partners? Um, because there, there used to be like the gold standard SNF uh, admission uh, for somebody who's uh, you know, quite highly functioning and not a lot of comorbidities and maybe they had a um, orthopedic surgery and they need some PT and OT and maybe they got a little swallowing problem so they could have some speech. That would have given the facility a lot of reimbursement under the old RUG4 system. But those days are gone now. So skilled nursing facilities are probably going to be poking around when they're doing their uh, pre-admission screening and looking for patients that have lots of comorbidities, such as diabetes with uh, complications such as retinopathy or uh, uh, diabetic ulcers, um, uh, folks with wound infections, COPD with acute exacerbation and shortness of breath. Um, diagnosed morbid obesity um, is a, is a non-therapy ancillary um, 
that is, uh, you're going to be seeing that documented a lot more, I believe, in skilled nursing facilities. So the the old um, uh, golden sniff uh, admission for a less complicated rehab patient, um, not to say that sniffs are going to turn them down because, frankly, sniffs need to fill their beds, uh, but they may be a little bit less of a draw and there might not be quite as much competition for those folks with the, um, with the admission liaisons from the sniffs. Now, the nursing facilities will also, as I mentioned earlier, want to have as much information as they can get earlier, uh, earlier better, rather than later for um, information about uh, uh, diagnoses, surgical reports, uh, discharge summaries, any uh, records of treatments that, uh, that were going on in the hospital so that they know what to expect and what to look for when that patient comes in their door. Now, it's incumbent on the SNF to do a complete assessment of that patient when they're admitted to the facility and determine which treatments and which diagnoses are going to continue to be active during the SNF stay. That's on them, but they, the, the more information further upstream, the better, so that the SNFs know um, better what to expect. Now, um, some, a lot of your SNF partners are most likely uh, training up their admissions liaisons and their personnel. They may be actually sending, uh, where they were sending marketing people out to the hospitals previously, they may very well be sending um, licensed nurses instead uh, who, are, uh, um, who have the familiarity and the, the clinical expertise and credentials to, um, to know what to look for. Okay, so I want to talk about a, a couple of components of PDPM that also may, um, may influence SNFs behavior. And again, it's very early to tell whether this will actually happen. But one of these, um, I alluded to this earlier, the variable per diem adjustment. So since um, a, a um, skilled nursing facility Part A beneficiary's reimbursement is going to be based on one MDS, one assessment at the beginning of the stay. That means that uh, as part of doing away with all of the other assessments that were required previously, CMS has baked in an adjustment to the per diem rate um, during, the, during the course of the SNF stay. So how this will work is during the first three days of a skilled nursing facility stay, um, most of the costs are, are front loaded uh, for the and on the SNF end. So that means that the non-therapy ancillary or NTA component has a three times 3x adjustment. It's multiplied by three, that one component of PDPM. So higher reimbursement for the first three days of the stay, and then it drops off to a level that maintains throughout the rest of that Medicare stay. And the NTAs are, are really, really driven by those comorbidities, those uh, a lot of diagnoses and other special treatment and care needs. So that's why the, the SNF is going to want to have that information so they, they can capture it on that first MDS and be able to reap that 3x adjustment. Now, the PTOT component also adjusts downward, um, but it's it's really, you, you may have heard that uh, anecdotally that SNFs are going to really shorten their length of stay because of this variable per diem adjustment. Um, it's really not that big a deal, <laughs> in our opinion, at point right. Um, the adjustment doesn't begin until day 21 of the SNF stay. And what the adjustment is, is a 2% decrease every seven days, beginning on day 21, then day 28, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, it doesn't matter how much therapy is being provided, or even if therapy is being provided at all, um, you may be admitting a patient to the skilled nursing facility who's not appropriate for skilled physical or occupational therapy. The SNF still gets reimbursed under this payment component, which is totally uh, totally new paradigm for the SNFs who are used to fee for service. Um, but no matter how much therapy is or is not being provided, it's not going to affect the PDPM reimbursement one bit. The payment is kind of set to auto adjust. So um, the point with that being, it, it's it's not the PTOT component will adjust downward, but it, it it's not until the first three weeks of the stay are completed, and it's a two percent adjustment every seven days. So it's not a cliff 
the facilities are going to try to avoid, or we don't believe so anyway. Now, another moving part in PDPM is the interrupted stay policy. So, um, what happens here? <laughs> Often, when you are um, when you refer a patient to a skilled nursing facility and they initiate their their Medicare skilled benefit in the skilled nursing facility, sometimes you see these folks back, right? Um, so, what what happens if a Medicare Part A beneficiary is discharged from skilled Part A coverage? Um, from the SNF and then returns to that same skilled nursing facility to a skilled level of care within three calendar days. That same Medicare stay will pick up from the point of discharge. So when will this happen? Um, it's often going to happen with a discharge to the hospital and a readmission back to the same SNF after the hospital stay or sometimes a, a, a patient may be discharged to the community and that discharge doesn't stick and the SNF grabs it back within the first three days. Um, hopefully SNFs will be coordinated with their um, post-discharge uh, communication so they'll know when they can do that. Or just a, a discharge from skilled services. In, in the SNF world, we call this dropping skill. Uh, if the um, skilled uh, beneficiary, skilled resident, no longer qualifies for daily skilled services in the, in the facility, then they drop to a custodial level of care, um, but the patient will remain in the SNF. So, but sometimes that, that skill therapy resumes <laughs> pretty quickly um, and, uh, and the SNF may have, uh, have uh, jumped the gun a little bit too much on pulling the plug on those skilled services. So basically, if, if this break in the skilled benefit and resumption of the skilled benefit at the same skilled nursing facility resumes within three calendar days, then the state picks up where it left off. Now the interrupted, that means there's no new assessment that's required, no new Medicare, initial Medicare assessment, and the per variable per diem rate does not reset. So the variable rate uh, picks up where um, uh, from the day, from the last covered day. Now, what are the implications of these two policies on length of stay? And I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, now, it is possible that um, you may have some skilled nursing facility partners who are all about grabbing those really complex patients. So we're going to take on all of these um, high acuity, challenging patients with lots of comorbidities, which is great. And, and SNFs have, have uh, very competent care teams and, and processes in place that, um, that for the most part, can handle these higher acuity patients. Maybe they need to um, up their skill set a little bit, or put in place some new programs, such as a um, you know re renewing their cardiac rehab program or something like that. But sometimes it may happen that there might be a bump up in rehospitalization rates as the SNFs adjust to um, to focusing on these higher acuity, more complex patients. So that is a possibility. We're not going to say it's definitely going to happen, of course. Now that variable per diem adjustment is always going to go down. It's not going to go back up. Um, so it, it may be thought of as an incentive to discharge patients or residents from the facility um, it, um, prematurely in order to create an open bed that you can then uh, admit a new referral from from the hospital with the highest reimbursement at the beginning of that stay. Now, it, on paper, it is an incentive to do something like that. Practically speaking, it costs a lot of money to discharge somebody and admit somebody else into a SNF, and um, the, the consequences may, may, again, have unintended consequences from both the SNF and the hospital's end. So, that might happen, but uh, we'll we'll see what the data looks like as far as readmissions, uh, you know, within the first three months of PDPM. Now, um, you may be hearing from your skilled nursing facilities when you discharge when they discharge a patient back to you who are in the middle of a sniff stay. 
to kind of hold off if you're ready to send a, a, a resident back to the skilled nursing facility and it's still within that three-day interrupted stay window uh, they might say um, we're waxing our floors today <laughs> or uh, can you hold off one more day and and uh, and just make sure that they're stable before you send them back to us because if the readmission if the if the discharge back to the SNF is after that three day interrupted stay window, that creates a brand new stay in the skilled nursing facility, which means a new assessment, a new um, variable per diem adjustment with that three x multiplier at the beginning of the stay. So it does seem to incentivize, again, on paper, incentivize skilled nursing facilities to discharge to the hospital, bring them back on day four or later, and, um, and bump up that reimbursement. Again, that seems like a lot of work, <laughs> at least to my perspective. So I mentioned the interim payment assessment. This is a totally optional MDS. The SNFs are only going to complete this assessment if it's going to change the case mix class classification in one or more of the PDPM components. And frankly, it's only going to happen if that uh, change is upward, not downward. So, um, SNFs are probably going to be uh, keeping an eye on those patients that are sub, uh, admitted to or um, are, are sent to your hospital, uh, but not admitted. So they're there under an observation visit or an ED stay. Now, if um, if an observation or ED stay is less than 24 hours, then technically that patient is still a resident in that skilled nursing facility, so it's not a discharge. But the SNF is going to need to know: Did they? Did you transfuse them? Use transfuse them? Uh, did they, you have to give them IV medications or IV fluids, or, or um, heaven forbid, did they need a vent in the uh, um, during that stay? Because those are drivers of PDPM, and when that uh, resident comes back to the skilled nursing facility, even if it doesn't start a new stay, there might be an opportunity to complete an interim payment assessment and bump up that reimbursement. Now, when that interim payment assessment is completed, the payment change is effective with the, the ARD, the anchor date of that MDS. So um, the skilled nursing facilities are going to want to have that information at their fingertips tips as quickly as possible so that they can determine if they should set that date and do that assessment as soon as possible. So I've been talking about what's changing and a lot is changing and uh, skilled nursing facilities have been preparing for this for the better part of a year, some with uh, uh, more proactiveness <laughs> than others, if proactiveness is a word. Um, but what they're, the fundamentals of Medicare skilled reimbursement in the skilled nursing facility and the benefit is not changing. So here's what's not going to change. The minimum data set MDS assessment itself is not changing. There are additional pieces being added to it to capture, for example, specific types of surgery, but the MDS itself is not changing. The um, Medicare skilled criteria are not changing. Um, there's been some tweaks in the terminology for the Medicare uh, benefit policy manual that were actually just released, I believe, yesterday um, or earlier this week. But that's that's really changes the terminology. Um, but the the fundamentals of the Medicare benefit program for skilled SNF stays ha are not changing one bit. Now. The amount of therapies provided in a skilled nursing facility should not change. Even though therapy does not affect SNF per diem rates one tiny bit in, in, the, in the new world of PDPM, but CMS has been very, very clear. Hey, if you, if you skilled nursing facilities and your rehab departments have been providing appropriate medically necessary therapies all this time and getting high reimbursement for fee-for-service, Going forward, that should not change because those therapies are still going to be appropriate and medically necessary in, in uh, type of therapy, duration of therapy, the volume of therapy. So um, SNFs are gonna, not going to stop giving therapy. Now, there have been stories in the news over the last week of some very large corporations laying off a good percentage of their therapy staff, which is unfortunate. Um, but 
um, SNFs are still, you know, required to provide whatever medically necessary services are needed for those patients to rehabilitate from their hospital stay, and that includes st uh, therapies. Now, um, you should also not see any changes in how um, uh, SNFs accept your referrals. Um, skilled nursing facilities always want to fill their beds, so they're not going to delay um, uh, several days to wait for, uh, to decide if they want to accept a patient or not from your facility, but you're probably going to be hearing from those SNFs a lot more frequently and a lot earlier to say, hey, you got anybody that you're planning on discharging within the next few days? You know, can I see their records? You know, you're probably going to be hearing from those facilities a little bit further upstream in the process. Okay, well, I reached the end of my slides already. Um, so there are um, there are some questions in the chat, but this is my contact information and this is also in the handout. So if any questions occur to you later on, please feel free to reach out to me or shoot me an email. I'll be happy to help you with that, um, either myself or, or one of my colleagues on the uh, clinical resource team at Point Right will uh, be happy to answer your questions. We are going to be following up with more research and, and probably more webinars and white papers going forward as PDPM um, gets settled in and we are able to collect more data and do some uh, in analytics on how, um, how this big shift has had uh, an impact on skilled nursing facility operations. Um, and also, if you would like to learn more about Point Right and uh, what we do to help hospitals coordinate care with their skilled nursing facility um, partners, I'd like to refer you to Karen O'Driscoll. She is our VP of Post-Acute Solutions. This is her contact information. Um, she'll be happy to um, uh, tell you all about Point Right and um, how we could potentially help you going forward. So I'm going to leave Karen's slide up um, so that I can check your um, Check your questions. Oh, there's a lot of questions. Um, so I did plan on this being about 45 minutes, so it uh, it did work out perfectly. I'm going to spend the next five minutes or so answering the questions. Um, so here's a first question right off the bat. Very good. Will CMS be monitoring the relative frequency of IPAs uh, for any evidence of uh, of you know gaming the system or or um, inappropriate uh, usage of IPAs. That is one of the things that CMS has been very clear that they're going to be monitoring for. So um, they're, they're going to be monitoring for frequency of IPAs oh, and the appropriateness of those interim payment assessments. And the really the big thing that they're going to be monitoring is the ongoing therapy delivery because the amount of therapy provided is still going to be coded on that MDS assessment um, at the end of the Medicare stay and CMS is going to be using that information to track how uh, what what that uh, behavior of care delivery and how that changes over time. Um, so uh, okay here's a question prior to PDPM SNFs asked for a PT eval before accepting a patient will a PT eval no longer be necessary well um, the 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 therapists in the SNF are going to, you know, still going to be responsible for, for completing their own evals if they're appropriate. If a patient comes to the SNF and they are appropriate for physical or occupational or speech therapy, um, they, they will need the order for those evals um, on admission or, or a recommendation to the attending physician at the SNF to order those evaluations. So um, the, all of that is not going to change and that approach should not change either. So you're probably still going to be hearing the same thing from the SNFs, um, contrary to rumor. <laughs> Um, oh, good question. What do you anticipate the change in staffing mix will need to be to care for the medically complex patients? I think it depends on the comorbidities, uh, really. Um, uh, some comorbidities are ex um, very, very complex. If there's multiple wound care, if there is uh, um, uh, medications that are being titrated, if, um, uh, of course, there's a, all, still the HIV AIDS add-on um, is, is still a part of the Medicare program. Um, so there's that piece, but there are also comorbidities that are um, uh, 
clinically important but not as medically complex, such as morbid obesity, um, cognitive impairment, things like that. So uh, depending on the patient's mix, uh, it could be more of a need for uh, more certified nursing assistants versus um, RNs. Um, but uh, the, the good thing is that most SNF companies, rather than laying off their RNs who are MDS staff, <laughs> because there are fewer MDSs that are required, are repurposing them and using them as care coordinators and making sure that the ICD-10 coding is accurate. So um, I, I see SNFs really investing more in their RNs, if anything. Um, and again, the question about the PTOT notes, therapy is still an expectation in the skilled nursing facility, so anything that you can provide those SNFs as far as uh, PTOT recommendations and the evaluations in the hospital, um, they're, they're still going to be just as needed because it's still going to be um, uh, clinically appropriate. Uh, for those of you who have not downloaded the handout, uh, the, the presentation slides are um, the in handout form are available for download on the um, on the GoToWebinar website. Um, if you uh, if you're looking for the actual presentation PowerPoint deck, um, please shoot me an email. I'll put my slide back up again, and I'll just check with our marketing department to see if we'll be distributing that because I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Um, let's see here, what else we got? Um, yes, we are uh, distributing the handouts afterwards. You'll be getting a follow-up email from us. Um, if, it get, uh, if you don't receive this email within the next uh, 24 hours, please check your spam folders. <laughs> um, Okay, here's a question. What are hospitals doing to help skilled nursing facilities identify ICD-10 codes slash DRGs um, and, and participants in bundled payment uh, uh, programs uh, as patients transition to um, skilled care? It sounds like these codes will be playing a larger role in SNF reimbursement. Absolutely. So um, I, I didn't even touch on the bundles, but um, the SNFs are definitely going to need to know if a, if a, um, if a patient is a member of, uh, of one of those bundle plans. And um, the, the ICD-10 codes are gonna be really important. So it would be helpful if you provide, now SNFs don't use DRGs, but if you provide those treatment diagnoses as comprehensively as possible, as early as possible from possible from the hospital stay, then the SNFs will go and, and make sure that they're coding those ICD-10s appropriately for the SNF stay. Um, and yes, uh, last question, I do absolutely believe that the RNACs, the Resident Nurse Assessment Coordinators, aka MDS coordinators, are going to be much more um, clinically focused. So there, I, I see them ideally as being uh, more hands-on coordinators of care, um, developing their expertise in ICD-10 coding, and, and just getting more face to face. Now, I, I don't want to um, denigrate my colleagues by saying that they spend all their time in their office at a computer um, plugging in numbers, but for a while they're under the rug system of Medicare, it seems like that's all they had time to do. So um, I, when I first learned about PDPM, I was actually quite excited about it, even though it's such a big change, because it's, it's giving credit to all of the important nursing-related quote unquote, clinical information that had been um, obscured by the amount of therapy provided. Um, well, that's a, this is a good question. Will this change under PDPM be cost neutral or is Medicare trying to reduce reimbursement by a fixed percentage? CMS says everything is budget neutral, <laughs> so I, um, I I would have to uh, go back through the final rule to see if they make a statement on that. Um, but one of the problems that they are very clear that they are trying to fix with PDPM is the um, the overemphasis on highest level of reimbursement based on the volume of therapy that's provided. So. Um, it, it is likely that it is also trying to reduce reimbursement by a certain amount. There, there are also various other penalties for noncompliance that take off um, uh, percentages from the, um, uh, from the annual payment update. So 
ideally CMS wants to save money, but their official stance is always is that it will be budget neutral. <laughs> and and um, it really does kind of balance out because of the way the variable per diem adjustment works. There is the inflation for the first three days of the Medicare stay, which if it's captured correctly with all the comorbidities will mitigate the uh, the tapering off going forward. Okay. All right, I think I reached the end of the questions. Thank you for uh, for putting me to the test today. Um, and I appreciate your time today. So uh, please feel free to reach out to us, either myself or Karen O'Driscoll, if you have any questions about PointRight or any questions about the presentation. And I wish both you and your skilled nursing partners uh, success in the new world of PDPM. Thanks very much. Have a great day.